by special recording. General Mills, makers of Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, and Cheerios, the oat cereal ready to eat, present The Lone Ranger. With the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and the haughty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion Toto, the daring and resourceful mask rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. Hail, Silver. Away! This is the Lone Ranger. If you want to be a champion at anything, remember, others have done it in spite of obstacles. Take rodeo champion Bob Maynard. He did it the hard way. He proved champions are made, not born. Bob didn't even have the advantage of growing up on a western ranch. As a boy, he lived in Chicago. But Bob started riding when he was eight years old. At 14 in California, he became a stable hand. Today... Bob Maynard is one of the top money winners in rodeo competition. He sure is, Lone Ranger. And like many champions in all sports, Bob still chooses Wheaties for his favorite training dish. There's no question about it. Champions are made, not born. And there's no question why champions choose Wheaties for their training diet. They want that famous wheat energy. They get it with Wheaties because there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Champions are made, not born. Get on your way with Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions. An ex-Confederate officer named Ross Colburn was on his way to his ranch in Texas, not far from the town of Mule Jaw. Ross was only 32 years old. But his years of hard fighting and privation with Mosby's Rangers had left their mark in the grim lines of his hunger-pinched face. His faithful horse, Wonder, also showed the strain of the heartbreaking campaign. The half-starved animal was beginning to regain some of the flesh he had lost in the last terrible year of war. For on the trip home, Ross had paused as often as possible to let Wonder graze. They were approaching a fork in the trail when Ross saw three horsemen riding toward him. As they came closer, he recognized the riders. He waved and shouted, Rex! Bernie Winkle! Oh, Ross Colbert! No, go his way! You go The three ragged veterans named Bernie Latner, Rex Quinn, and Waco drew rein. Separated since the start of the war, they dismounted, shook hands, slapped each other on the back, and exchanged warm greetings. Doggone it, Ross. You've changed considerable. So have you, Waco. <laughs> Where'd you get all that gray hair, Ross? <laughs> uh, the Yankees gave it to me. Yeah, they gave me a bullet at Chancellorville. But I was lucky it hit me in the shoulder where it didn't do any permanent damage. Uh, there's been plenty of permanent damage done around here. Things are bad in Texas, Ross. They could be worse, Rex. What do you mean, worse? I talked to a lot of people on my way here. They told me what the situation is. I came back because this is an ideal base of operations. What kind of operations? Fighting operations. But we're surrounded, Ross. I look at the surrender as a temporary truce. Truce? Thunderation. We were beaten into the ground. We were outnumbered, outsupplied. But we weren't outgeneraled or outfought. Even with better weapons and ammunition than we have, the Yanks didn't put up a better fight. Man for man, we could have whipped them if we'd had the food to keep going. Yeah. Well, it's over now. Not for me, it isn't. What well, do you mean? Now, for a lot of other veterans I've talked to on the way here. We'll fight again. With what? A guerrilla force to harass the Federals. When we build up an army large enough to do some real damage, 
We'll go to one of our generals and ask him to take command. But you'll need weapons, ammunition, horses, food. You can't get those without money. Rex, do you know what a steer's worth in northern markets? No. It'll bring $40 in hard American cash. $40? $40 a head? That's right. And the people in the north will buy as much beef as we can deliver. Well, I aim to deliver that beef. I'll use all the cash I can accumulate to buy what we need. Are you boys willing to throw in with me? Well, I'm game, Ross. So am I. Count on me. Good. We've a lot of hard work ahead of us, boys. But we'll be working for the South. For the Confederacy. Ross and his friends found other young veterans to help round up cattle enough to begin the ambitious drive to the north. At length, they were ready to start. The drive progressed without interruption until it reached Kansas. There, the Texans were stopped by the fences of farmers who refused to let the cattle cross their land. It was late at night, and a full moon shone brightly on the campfire, where Ross, Rex Quinn, Bernie Ladner, and Waco sat making plans. Hey, two riders are heading this way. Uh, probably a couple of the boys coming to see if we figured a way to get past those fences. No, they're not our boys, Rex. They're coming from that homestead. They're riding good horses? <laughs> Great day, Ross. One of those fellows is mad. Yeah, you right, Waco. Cover them, boys. Yeah, right. The Texans didn't know that the masked man was the Lone Ranger. Expecting trouble, they held their guns steady as the tall stranger and his Indian companion drew rein at the edge of the firelit clearing. No comment, mister. Is it customary for men from Texas to draw guns without cause? That mask is cause enough. How'd you know we were from Texas? A homesteader named Ned Morgan told me. He also asked me to tell you that you may drive your cattle across his land. What did you say? If you'll come with Hull and me, we'll take you to Morgan. A short time later, Ross, Rex, Bernie, and Waco were in Ned Morgan's small cabin. With Morgan were two other homesteaders who agreed to let the Texans cross their land. Ross Colburn thanked them and said, There's just one thing I don't savvy, Morgan. You and every homesteader around here were dead set against letting us through. What changed your mind? The mass man who brought you here. He found out that your drive was stopped. He pointed out the fact that Hank and Mark and I didn't have any crops planted. He talked us into taking down our fences and letting you through our land. We're downright obliged to you, Morgan. Yeah, if there's any way we can repay you. Oh, don't thank me and my friends. Thank the masked man. But why did he want to help us? I don't know. The next time you meet the Lone Ranger, ask him. The Lone Ranger. That was the first time the Texans met the masked man. But they were destined to meet again. The drive was completed, and on the return trip, Ross and his friends reached an agreement with the homesteaders, an agreement that would permit them to cross the farmland at a later date. They used the profits from the drive to buy guns, ammunition, horses, and supplies, and concentrated on accumulating more with which to finance their plans. After several other drives, their activities finally came to the attention of federal authorities. Messages concerning them were flashed to Washington. Agents were sent to investigate the situation, and when they returned to the capital, they reported directly to the president. The result was an immediate summons to the governor of Texas. The governor hurried to Washington, and on his return home, he stopped briefly at the ranch of Clarabelle Hornblow. When he left, Clarabelle and Thunder both knew that the governor wanted to see the Lone Ranger. Several days later, the masked man and his Indian companion stopped at the ranch. As soon as they entered the house, Clarabelle told them of the governor's visit. The Lone Ranger and Toto swung to the saddle and headed for the governor's residence. After two days and nights of steady travel, they drew rein and dismounted in the darkness, a short distance from the official mansion. Keeping to the shadows to avoid being seen, The Lone Ranger made his way to the French doors of the governor's office. Looking inside, he saw that the official was alone. He tapped on the glass softly. A moment later, the door opened. It's you. Good evening, Governor. Come inside, please. I must talk to you. The governor drew the office curtains, then took a number of papers and maps from his desk. 
These, sir, came from Washington. The president himself entrusted them to me. Then you've been to Washington? Yes. I was sent for because a group of veterans here in Texas are organizing an army to continue the struggle against federal authority. Oh, who's leading the army? Four Confederate soldiers. A Ross Colburn seems to be the leader. He was with Colonel Mosby's Virginia Cavalry during the war. Mosby's Rangers, huh? Yes. Bernie Ladner was an artilleryman in the Army of Northern Virginia. Rex Quinn is one of the few survivors of Jackson's famous Stonewall Brigade. And a man named Waco rode with Jeb Stewart's cavalry. Government agents investigated all of them. Here are the reports. Mm. Colburn, Ladner, Quinn, and Waco. You know them? Yes, sir. We met some time ago when they were driving cattle through Kansas. If the president is aware of the situation, why doesn't he send troops to disband the army? To disband them by force would accomplish the immediate purpose. But it would do nothing to erase the hatred that resulted in war. Unless those men voluntarily accept our flag as their flag, we can never hope for real peace and unity. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. This is Mel Allen, sports announcer, and I've been in this business long enough to know that champions are made, not born. Isn't that the way it should be? It gives every youngster a chance. Take Betty Shallow, figure skating beauty with the famous ship stads and Johnson ice follies. Why, she was learning to cut figure eights years ago. Been eating Wheaties since she was only chin high to her breakfast bowl. Twenty years ago, that was. Or Otto Graham of the Cleveland Browns, who can thread a needle with a forward pass. Otto made himself a champion, practiced hours every chance he had, and been really going for that Wheaties breakfast for 23 seasons. There's so doggone much honest energy packed into Wheaties. Nothing you pick at and push aside, for Wheaties are downright goblin good. Let me say again what champions know. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. And don't you lose track of this fact for a minute. Champions are made, not born. Get on your way with Wheaties, breakfast of champions. <laughs> to continue. The Lone Ranger listened soberly to the governor's account of the problem that might result in the resumption of hostilities between the North and South. Those armed veterans must disband willingly, disarm, and return to their homes. What can I do to help, sir? I'm authorized to ask you to act unofficially for the government. If you are acquainted with Colburn and his friends, you may be able to persuade them to give up their plan. I don't think that's possible, sir. What? I haven't that much influence with them. You could reason with them. You think that would change their loyalties? But confound it, there must be a way short of bloodshed to stop him. I told the president you were the only man who could do it. Only one man could do it. But if you can't do it, who can? Robert E. Lee. The commanding general of the Confederate forces? Yes, sir. You expect him to persuade Confederate soldiers to abandon their plans? Yes, sir. But he represents everything they fought for. He's the greatest rebel of them all. He's a great man. I think he's a great American. He's a paroled prisoner of war, sir. Governor, will you give me a letter of introduction to General Lee? You counting on his help? I'm going to ask for it. I'll give you the letter... But I shall be sorry to report to the president that we have failed. Save your report until you hear from me, sir. It was mid-afternoon of the next day when a sentry halted the Lone Ranger and Tonto at the entrance to a valley near Mule Jaw Mountain. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, Don't try reaching for your gun. Where's Ross Colburn? In camp. Will you take me to him? All right, but I'll have to fire a warning shot to alert the camp that you're coming. Go ahead. There. 
Now then, mister, follow me. Come on, Jim. The sentry led the way through the valley entrance. Rounding a bend in the trail, they saw a group of armed men coming toward them. Colburn and his three friends were in the lead. Colburn, I'm here to see you and your three friends. You're the Lone Ranger. That's right. Back to your tent, man. This man, the engine of rain. All right. Colburn, let's go into your tent. We have a lot to talk about. Colburn and his friends led the way to an army tent. Tonto stood guard outside while the Lone Ranger told the four veterans that the authorities were aware of their activities. They know the location of this headquarters, and they know your plans. Thanks for the warning, mister. Now that we know they're wise to us, we'll move carefully. You intend to go ahead? You're doggone right. Who leads you? If Jeb Stewart were alive, he'd map strategy that would drive the Yankees clean out of the Southwest. Stewart's dead. Well, there's Mosby. Maybe he... You're talking about subordinate officers. Well, that's right. What? What? You're entirely forgetting the greatest general of them all. Why? What? What? The man who led the Confederate Army. You... You mean... I mean Robert E. Lee. Great day. If General Lee would take command... Why not ask him what he thinks of your plan? Where would we find him? I'll take you to him. Will your men remain here until we return? Well, they'll stay here till doomsday if they think the General's coming back to lead him. Get away! Eager for the sight of their old commander, the four veterans quickly prepared for the long journey with a masked man and Tonto. Leaving orders with the men who were to remain in the valley, Ross asked... Are you fellas all set? All set, yeah, right. then let's travel. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 The riders traveled at a ground-covering lope, and during the long trip, the Lone Ranger and Tonto found the ex-soldiers good companions. Avoiding towns and settlements, where the Lone Ranger's mask would be questioned, they rode steadily. As they moved into the state of Virginia, the men became grim and silent. They were not far from the battlefields where many of their comrades had fallen. We'll reach Lexington tonight. That's where we'll find General Lee? Yes. Here, come on, oh, come on, oh, come After 9 o'clock that evening, when they reached the vicinity of Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, they drew rein a short distance from the college building. <laughs> While the four veterans studied the moonlit landscape, the Lone Ranger took the governor's letter from his pocket and handed it to Tonto. Tonto, will you take this letter to General Lee and ask him if he'll meet us here? Ah, and where may he find him? He'll be in the college president's house. You'll have to ask directions to it. Let me see. Come, Scout. Come, fella. Do you... Do you think he'll come to meet us, mister? We'll have to wait and see. The men dismounted and stood beside their horses, waiting for Tonto to return. Five minutes passed. Ten minutes. And then the sound of hoofs broke the quiet of the college surroundings. At length, two riders came into view. They recognized Tonto, but the half brim obscured the face of the other horseman. Can it be? There was something familiar about the gait of the handsome gray horse and an unmistakable dignity about the man in the saddle. Suddenly, Ross Colburn reached for his hat. As he removed it, he murmured, Boys, it's Master Robert. It's Uncle Bob. General, General Lee. Oh, oh. The rider who brought the beloved war horse traveler to a halt in the moonlit clearing was no ordinary man. For no ordinary man could have inspired the blind loyalty of men like Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart, A.P. Hill, and countless other brave soldiers. Robert E. Lee was a great man. And as the Lone Ranger met him for the second time in his career, he knew that he had made no mistake in reuniting the four veterans with their old commander. The general's voice was warm and friendly when he spoke to the masked man. We've met before, sir. I wasn't sure you'd remember the meeting, General Lee. I do remember him. He did me a great service in the West years ago. I'm glad to see you again. Thank you, sir. Well, gentlemen, what may I do for you? Captain Ross Colburn, 43rd Battalion, Virginia Cavalry, reporting for duty, General. Duty, Captain Colburn? That's right, sir. Our friends and I are here to offer our services. We've accumulated guns, ammunition, supplies, 
and a hundred ex-soldiers who were ready to go on with the fight. Ross spoke eagerly, but the general listened in silence. We've only a hundred men now. But if we can go back to Texas and say that you'll lead us, we'll be able to muster an army of thousands. So that's why you're here. We've come all the way from Texas to ask you to lead us again. We weren't outfought the last time, General Lee. And with luck, sir... I know we weren't outfought, Captain. No men ever fought better than those who stood by me. We'll lick the Yankees for sure this time. Gentlemen, the disputed matters between the North and South were decided by war. We must abide by that decision. I gave my word, gentlemen. Well, yes. we, but, but, sir, we were never a battle the South fought. We came... Oh, from... you were good soldiers, loyal soldiers... But your duty now is to unite in an honest effort to obliterate the effects of war and restore the blessings of peace to our land. Peace, sir? Yes. Promote harmony and good feeling. Qualify yourselves to vote and then elect to the state and general legislatures wise and patriotic men who will devote their abilities to the interests of the country and the healing of dissension. Sure. I have invariably recommended this course since the cessation of hostilities, and I've endeavored to practice it myself. But, but what about us? We've worked to build up an armed force. We've got supplies and men who are ready to fight. We're waiting for orders. Gentlemen, I earnestly hope that you will abandon your animosities and make your sons American. <laughs> Later that night, the four veterans were traveling west. They had been silent and thoughtful until Ross suddenly missed the masked man who had been traveling with them. Where's the Lone Ranger? He said he had to send a telegram to the governor of Texas. He and Carlo will join us later. Uh, well, boys, we have a lot to do when we get home. We'll have to disband the men. Divide the weapons and the food. And head back to our ranches to try to build them up again. Never expected things to turn out this way. I think the masked man knew how they'd turn out. Huh? What do you mean, Rose? I don't think General Lee's advice was any surprise to the Lone Ranger. Every delicious spoonful of Cheerios and milk is real muscle-building food. Each spoonful contains vitamins, minerals, and proteins your body needs. Yes, the good things in a Cheerios breakfast do good things for your body. Help you have healthy nerves, good red blood, strong bones, and muscles. Cheerios, remember, is made from oats, yet needs no cooking. Eat Cheerios, the cereal shaped like little letter O's. Then you'll hear people say... She's feeling her Cheerios. The Lone Ranger, a copyrighted feature of The Lone Ranger Incorporated, is created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of The Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Your announcer, Fred Foy. The Lone Ranger is brought to you by General Mills every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this same time. Be sure to listen.